By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we have a match for you that is be being played at the Camel Trophy, an old school magic tournament held in Arnhem. And this is uh, a match played in the Swiss rounds. We're going to look at two pretty cool decks. We've got Chris, who is playing with a Guardian Beast deck. It's really sweet. It's uh, Guardian Beast, Navneral's Disc, Chaos Orb. It's got some trolls in there. It's it's super interesting. I'm looking forward to show it to you. And he's playing against Edo, who is on the Time Vault Stasis strategy with some beautiful Sarah Angels. So it's mainly blue and white. I've got lovely deck photos of both of these decks. But first, I would like to mention that if you want to skip this section and go straight to the games, the easiest way to do that is by checking the description below because there you will find several timestamps. One of those timestamps reads MTG Games. Click on there and that will take you straight to the action. Um, the description below is also very useful if you want to know more about the specific rule sets of this tournament. I can already tell you that they're playing according to gentlemen's rules. That means no Library of Alexandria in these games and no Mind Twist in these games either. Okay, so now that you're all up to date, we are ready to move ahead with the deck deck. I'm going to start with the Guardian Beast deck of Chris. Let's have a look. And here we see the deck of Chris. Well, it's a, it's a lovely deck, first of all. But the first thing I really noticed that kind of draws my attention are those four beautiful Guardian Beasts. Guardian Beast, a 2-4 creature for one black and three that reads, as long as Guardian Beast is untapped, your non-creature artifacts cannot be further enchanted, destroyed, or taken under someone else's control. If something occurs that would destroy the beast and artifact simultaneously, the Guardian Beast is destroyed, but your artifacts are not. If an artifact is enchanted or stolen while the beast is tapped, it remains so when Guardian Beast becomes untapped. In other words, you want to keep this beast untapped. This card works together really well with Nevenerals Disc. We see three Nevenerals Discs here in uh, the deck of Chris. Nevenerals Disc, of course, four to cast, comes into play ta uh, tapped. When it untaps, you can pay one, tap it, and it destroys all enchantments, all artifacts, and all creatures, right? So what you can do is you can regenerate your creatures. So that's why we see the set trolls in here. And when you've got a Guardian Beast in play, when you pop the disc, it means that your Guardian Beast, yes, it is going to die unless you can give it regeneration somehow. Um, but your Nevernal's disc actually comes back because you cannot destroy it because of the Guardian Beast, right? So that is pretty sweet. Another really nice synergy in this deck is Chaos Orb with the Guardian Beast. Because when you use your Chaos Orb, it destroys itself. But with uh, Guardian Beast in play, it cannot destroy itself. So it actually stays there, but it is tapped. So you have to wait another turn before you can use the Chaos Orb again. But in the right scenario, you can start copying your Chaos Orbs and then every single turn you can flip them again because they don't get destroyed because of the Beast. So the Beast is super important. Then he's kind of surrounding this strategy with a lot of direct damage and just a lot of good cards, right? We see four counter spells, we see Ancestral Recall, we see Mana Drain, then we see four Lightning Bolts, we see three Side Blasts, we see a Fireball. So this is actually a really, really strong deck. I think City in a Bottle would kind of be, be a drag for Chris, also because he's playing with four um, City of Brasses. But apart from that, this, this looks like a pretty strong deck. What I also really like is that inclusion of that single Ali from Cairo. I think it's super cool. Ali from Cairo is an 0-1 creature for two uh, red and two that reads, while, while Ali is in play, damage that would reduce your life to less than one life lowers you to one life instead, and all further damage is prevented. So as long as you've got Ali from Cairo in the game, you cannot die. Now, obviously, it's just an 0-1 creature, uh, so you should be able to kill it, but maybe there are some circumstances where it can keep you alive. And Ali from Cairo also works together very well with the Mirror Universe. So Mirror Universe is, of course, this legendary card from, from Legends, six to cast for this artifact. Tap and sacrifice Mirror Universe only during your upkeep and then trade your number of life points with your opponent. So, of course, that goes great. Imagine you're on just one life, staying alive because of your Ali. You can then play your Mirror Universe, stay alive a little bit longer, then trade uh, your life totals with your opponent and then all of a sudden your opponent is on one and you can bolt them and win the game. So that is of course a pretty sweet way to uh, to win a battle. Uh, overall, I'm really looking forward to see this deck of Chris in action. It's not a deck you see very often, so I'm very excited to have it here on the channel. Now let's take a look at the deck of his opponent, Edo. 
And here we see the deck of Edo, so it's mainly white and blue. We do see one black card in the form of the Demonic Tutor, and I guess this is your Stasis Mana Vault deck, but it's different because we're seeing no Howling Mines. I mean, that's kind of insane, isn't it? Usually you need your Howling Mine to draw your islands to keep your Stasis around, but more importantly, to just draw more cards so you can find the components that matter, like Twiddle, like Mana Vault itself. Uh, we also see four Boomerangs in the deck, Boomerang and Stasis work together very well. I think I should first kind of start with just looking at the key cards of the deck, right? Stasis, of course, is an enchantment, one blue and one, that reads, players do not get an untapped face, pay one blue during your upkeep or Stasis is destroyed. So that means that everything that's getting tapped stays tapped for as long as Stasis is around. Now, this card obviously goes together really well with Sarah Angel because you don't have to tap Sarah Angel to attack. So you can just keep attacking with your Sarah while your Stasis is there and also unsummon works together very well with stasis because if your opponent has some bigger creatures or bigger permanents on the board well creatures actually because unsummon can only target creatures you can unsummon those creatures and it's going to be really tough for your opponent to cast them again while stasis is in play because once you tap a land once it doesn't untap anymore you know it just doesn't happen and then we see four boomerangs boomerang is two blue and then you can return any permanent back including the stasis itself so what you can do is on your end step of your opponent play a boomerang on your own stasis then you get to untap all your islands again and then you recast your stasis in your own main phase so that's also a really nice strategy that you see a lot and then the other key card in this deck of course is time vault so time vault is this legendary grand artifact right it hasn't been reprinted after unlimited it's two to cast beautiful art by mark tedden it reads tap to gain an additional turn after the current one time vault doesn't untap normally during untap phase to untap it you must skip a turn and time vault also comes in tapped so you may think okay this card it's not all that but look there's twiddle one blue to untap or tap target permanent so you can use your twiddle to untap your time vault and there could even be scenarios where you have a stasis and a time vault in the game and you've got your opponent completely locked that you want to give your opponent an extra turn by un untapping your time vault for example you've got some black vices out your opponent has a handful of cards he cannot cast them because his lands don't untap anymore then you can use your time vault untap your time vault and say here you go another turn more damage from the vice and win it that way so um yeah it's kind of a proven strategy it can be a very strong deck but i've never seen it without the Howling Mines. So that is really interesting. And what I'm also really liking about the Brew of Edo is that he wants to win with Sarah Angels as well. Usually these decks are creatureless, but I really like to see that old traditional combo between Stasis and Sarah Angel. I think that's just uh, beautiful. Maybe this deck could have used a few Yoshin Soldiers that would have been really cool as well. But of course, they're just not as good as a Sarah Angel. Anyway, this is the deck of Edo. Beautiful deck. We've looked at the deck of Chris again also beautiful that means we're ready let's go to the match game number one here we go so we have chris on the left with his guardian beast deck and on the right we have Edo with his stasis vault deck it looks like he's taking a mulligan there Edo, putting one card on the bottom it seems and chris starting out with an underground sea and a mox sapphire and ooh, an identical start by Edo. that is quite funny so both players now have counter magic online I wonder what they're going to do next. Just play a land and go. That's a Mistress Factory, so next turn he can start swinging. Let's see what Edo can do here. Playing a Scrub Land. He does have access to Swords to Plowshares and, of course, to Unsummons. So let's see if he's going to animate the Factory and swing. It looks like he does. So there is a Swords to Plowshares, but a Counterspell on the Swords, a Mana Drain. Are we going to see a Counterspell from Edo? And no, we're not. So he's going to take two damage. Going to go to 18. But it does mean that Edo has an opening here. Because Chris is stepped out. So that is quite nice. And next turn, of course, because of that uh, mana drain, Chris is going to get an extra mana. There we see a Tundra. Actually, a Stasis would be interesting right now. There's a Stasis. So that means Chris is not going to untap anything. Pretty early Stasis. I wonder if that means that Edo has a Boomerang. Let's see what Chris can do. Chris playing an underground sea. He's of course has that one mana in the mana pool still from the mana drain on the sword. So he's got two mana. 
It's going to use the one mana. No, it's just going to go away. No mana burn in uh, Swedish rules. There we see another island being played by Edo. No boomerang there on the end step. And just to pass turn. So Edo has, uh, has got full control at the moment, but he doesn't have a vice out or anything else to actually deal damage with. There we see another land by Chris. So I guess if you're Chris, you're kind of fine with it. I mean, it's not ideal, but as long as Edo is unable to put some pressure on here, we're going to see the boomerang probably. So on end step, the boomerang is going to take back the stasis into his own hand. And of course, not the boomerang. So the boomerang should go to the graveyard. I believe, I believe Edo actually told me about this misplay. So just to clarify, it should be in the yard. And now we're going to see a counterspell. Can he protect it with another counterspell? No, he cannot. Unable to protect it here. I'm passing the turn to Chris. So Chris can now try to swing in again, of course, with the factor. Or maybe he has better options. He now knows about the stasis, so that's kind of surprise is, is done for. Yeah, now Edo is putting the boomerang in the graveyard where it belongs, realizing his mistake. Attacking here, so he's going to drop to 16. And he's untapping here. It was kind of unfortunate for Edo to lose that Sarah Angel to the counterspell. Very important counter by, uh, by Chris. But of course, Chris has more ways to deal with four toughness creatures, having access to Psyblasts, I believe, three in his deck. And of course, a single fireball and then four lightning bolts. There is, we see a strip mine. It's going to attack for two here. Edo's going to drop to 14 or not. Let's see what he's going to do. Are we going to see a disenchant? Disenchant. And then are we going to see a counterspell? No counterspell from Chris. So Edo on 16, Chris on 20 still. And he still has that stasis in hand, eh? Edo. So there we see a tap for three. There's a Setch Troll. This is really good. A 3-3 three, three creature with regeneration. That could be annoying for Edo. So Edo, three cards in hand now. It was looking quite well for Edo as long as he had that stasis in hand and when he played that boomerang on his stasis. But yeah, after that, it seems like the tables have turned a little bit. There we see the stasis again. I believe we're going to see a counterspell here. Counterspell. Are we going to see a counterspell on the counterspell? No, we're not. For a moment, it looked like Edo was going to tap something to counter it. He's going to play a Time Vault instead and passing the turn. So I guess the good news for Edo is that Chris is kind of running out of counterspells. He's played two counterspells and the Mana Drain, so he only has two more counterspells in his deck. He has that set draw, of course. I'm expecting him to attack for three, putting Edo on 13. Let's see what else he can do. Tapping four. Are we going to see a Guardian Beast? There's a Guardian Beast. Two, four creature. Giving all, the, all his artifacts indestructible for as long as the Guardian Beast remains. Ooh, Chaos Orb. This is the combo he wants to have. Chaos Orb and Guardian Beast together on the board. This is so deadly for Edo. This is what Chris wants to do here. Flipping, hitting the Time Vault. And here you can see what happens. The Chaos Orb comes back. It doesn't destroy itself because of the Guardian Beast. It comes back into play tapped. And next turn, Chris can start doing his thing again. This is really bad news for Edo. Needs to at least do something against or the Guardian Beast or against the Chaos Orb. I guess you just want to plow the Guardian Beast. Stasis would have been an option as well, but he cannot find it. Only one card in hand, it looks like, for Edo. It's looking very bad for him here in the first game of this match. I'm expecting Chris here just to attack. Maybe first flip. Okay, he's going to flip first. Going to probably go on a dual land. And let's see if he can hit it. I mean, there's a lot of flipping. So he's hitting the Tundra. He's going to attack for three. Putting Edo on ten and passing the turn. This is exactly what Chris wants to do with his deck. There's a pass by Edo and... It's not, he knows it. It's not looking good. There is another threat in the form of a Mishra's Factory. Another flip again. And, okay, there's an Unsummon on the Guardian Beast. That is quite interesting. So that's going to go back. At least that's going to destroy his Chaos Orb. So that's, some, that's a pretty cool way, actually, of, of, of taking care of the Chaos Orb in this scenario, using that Unsummon that way. That's pretty sweet. 
So at least he's destroyed the Chaos Orb with that Unsummon. Now he's probably going to recast the Beast. He's going to attack here, putting Edo on 7. And passing the turn. Edo tapping 2 for the Time Vault again. Passing turn, yeah, the Time Vault is not going to save him. There's going to be an attack here for 7. That's it, because he's on 7. It's the end of the road for Edo in game number one, 1. Now both of these players are going to dive into their sideboards. And uh, we'll catch back up with them in game number 2. Game number 2, here we go. Edo on the play after losing that first game. Starting with a Tundra and a pass. There's an Underground Sea by Chris in the pass. So both players kind of know what the other person wants to do. There we see an early Chaos Orb and a flip straight away on the Underground Sea. Just wants to get rid of that sea and it's a hit. Beautiful black bordered Chaos Orb by the way, by Edo. And now what I wanted to say is both players really have a strategy, right? Chris is gonna go for Guardian Beast and Edo is gonna go for the Time Vault and the Stasis and both players are now aware of that. So they have a lot of information about each other's decks. And we can see Edo really had on Mana Curve. Maybe next turn he can... Ooh, there's an Ancestral Recall for him as well. I wanted to say maybe next turn he can cast... Oh no, there's a Red Elemental Blast though. Taking care of business. Really sweet Red Elemental Blast. And maybe this turn Edo can cast a Sarah Angel. That would be kind of sweet. Chris doesn't have any counter mana open, but he doesn't have a Sarah though. Just passing the turn. And I think that Red Elemental Blast was very important for Chris, taking care of that Ancestral Recall. Because Edo is already ahead on, on mana, and if he also gets ahead on cards, then it's almost a lost cause here in game number two. There we see an Underground Sea by Chris. I don't expect him to animate the Factory here, simply because his lands are just too valuable for him. He's going to tap three, he's going to cast a Setch Troll. There is a Swords to Plowshares. If you know that your opponent has, you know, Swords to Plowshares and Counter Magic to deal with your Setch Trolls, you actually don't have to wait until you have four mana open to regenerate it because that makes no sense. So I think this is a good play by Chris. Because he knows it's gonna, if it's gonna be removed, it's gonna be done by a Swords anyway or a Counter Spell. Here we see a Guardian Beast, another Swords here by Edo. I'm sure Edo put some more Swords to Plowshares in the deck after, um, after that first game. And he's going to draw. He's got three cards in hand, it seems. He's going to play a book. Ooh, that book is important. If that book can stay, he can start finding some, uh, some cards. He's got two blue open to potentially counter. So I wonder how Chris is going to deal with that threat. He could use his strip mine to take care of a blue. Looks like he wants to attack with the factory. No, he doesn't. He just wants to tap those two for a Chaos Orb. There we see a counter spell on the Chaos Orb. No counter spell from Chris to protect the orb. So there's the pass. Of course, Edo wants to make sure that he can start using his, uh, his book. Knows the importance of that. Plays out another land. So he's got enough mana to end use the book and keep counter magic open. So two cards in hand right now. And there's the pass. Oh, Ancestral Recall on the end step by Chris. This is really nice. Are we going to see a counter spell from Edo? No, we're not. And those Ancestral Recalls, they can uh, be decisive in these matches where it's so close. Drawing three cards for one blue, insane value, of course. In my opinion, the best card in the game. There's a Mox Jet, there's another Factory. And now he's going to animate. Start to put some pressure on three damage to Edo. It's going to go to 17, first damage of the game. And look at that life total of Chris, by the way. It's still pretty high up because of those two Swords to Plowshares on the Guardian Beast and the Setch Troll earlier in the game. And even though Edo has that book, I'm kind of feeling that Chris has the momentum. Edo here finding a Time Vault, playing the Time Vault, passing the turn. Counterspell on the Time Vault though. There is the untap. 24 life for Chris. He's going to play a Mishra's Workshop. He's going to use the Workshop. Is he going to cast a Nevenerals Disc? Yeah, there's a Disc. Disc, of course, works perfect with the Mishra's Factories. 
because they don't get destroyed by the disc while they're still lands. He's first going to attack for four, going to put Edo on 13, so the disc is going to destroy the book, and I think it's worth it. I mean, the book is the biggest problem for Chris at the moment. If he can nullify the book, I mean, he's really ahead. Edo on 13, so next turn, Chris could use the disc, destroy the book, and then attack afterwards. There's a stasis, though. This is quite interesting. The stasis is important. There's a counterspell. That is unfortunate. That is unfortunate for Edo. He, he's going to use the book, but even if he finds a counterspell, finds a counterspell with that, I'm pretty sure he doesn't want to use it because then he's all tapped out himself and he cannot keep the stasis around for long. So this is a problem for Edo. I think, I think it's... it's it's not looking good for him. I'm expecting a swing of four here by Chris. Going to put Edo on nine. So, okay, he's going to pop the disc first. Destroy the book and the ruby. Makes sense. He doesn't want to give Edo another turn with that book. So this is the correct line of play in my opinion. There we see a recall. Discarding an island. What is he going to get back? He's going, of course, Ancestral Recall. Using the Recall to get back the Ancestral Recall. The way it should be, I guess. Does that mean he's not going to attack this turn? He is going to attack with Wanya, keeping a City of Brass open to play the Recall. Edo's going to drop to 11. And he's going to play a Tundra. He needs another Stasis. Okay, there's a stasis. This is actually kind of nice. This is what Edo needed. I wonder what Chris is going to do. I mean, do you want to draw three cards still? I don't... Yeah, he does want to draw three cards. I'm not sure if I would have done that, to be honest. Because Edo wants to win with his vices. Then again, of course, if you're Chris, you want to find land and you want to play out land every turn. So that kind of makes sense as well. Playing out another City of Brass. And passing the turn. So Edo paying one blue for the stasis. Finding another blue source and pass. Going through his library. And passing turn here to Chris. So it's quite an interesting game now. Because of that stasis. I thought Edo was done for. But that stasis really changed the situation. And Edo has a lot of islands there. So he can keep the stasis around for at least five more turns. And if he can find, for example, a Boomerang, you know, or a Black Vice, he can actually start dealing some damage to Chris. But for now, he's just passing turn. There's another land drop by Chris. There's a Black Lotus and a Soaring in hand there by Edo. So that Black Lotus can be super useful. If he can find a Sarah Angel, he could use the Lotus to cast it. Here we're seeing a soul ring, tapping the soul ring, tapping the city of brass. What is he going to cast? Going to play a demonic tutor. It's going to keep one in his mana pool. Interesting, because he doesn't have any colored mana. Is he going to look up a... Oh, he's probably going to look up a chaos orb, play the chaos orb with the workshop, having one mana open to flip it, and then on the stasis. That is probably his line of play. That is pretty sweet. And then, of course, he has to hope that Edo doesn't have a disenchant. Oh, he's not. Interesting. He is playing a Nevenerals disc. So perhaps, yeah, the disc, of course, doesn't untap. That is interesting. That is a little bit surprising. I expected him to maybe look up the Chaos Orb flipping on the stasis. Going for the disc instead. So Chris is really thinking about what am I going to do once the stasis is going to go away. Finding another island. Of course he's got to pay. Exactly. He's got to pay another one. And Edo paying again. I mean, this is not ideal for him. He was, of course, hoping to find something. Okay, there's finally something to deal damage. I'm unclear with the amount of cards in hand by Chris, but he's not taking any damage. So I guess he doesn't have more than four in hand. He's still on 21. And I think the moment that the stasis is out of the game, it's also the end of the road for Edo here. 
There we see a mock sapphire. So Edo paying again a blue, and this is the last blue source that he has. Has to find something. Tapping a white for a soul ring, playing the black lotus. Is he going to use the lotus to actually pay for the stasis? It is an option. He could also, of course, use the lotus to boomerang his own stasis. That's another option. But this is tough for Edo. I hope for him that he's got a boomerang in hand. And Stasis, uh, Stasis is tough here. He's going to play the Sarah Angel. Okay, he's going to do the Sarah Angel play. That means that at least next turn he can swing in with the Sarah. Unless, of course, Chris has a way now. He could play a Cyblast, for example, on the Sarah Angel to get rid of it. He's got enough mana to do so. So the Stasis is going to go. Only one white open. He's going to attack for four. He's going to put Chris on 17. But of course, Chris can untap next turn with everything. And then he can, you know, first point of business, I guess, is use the Neverneural's disc to destroy the Sarah, the Vice, and the Soul Ring on the side of Edo. And Chris already being ahead one game. Best of three, of course. So if he wins this game, he wins the match. Tapping three first. There's a side blast, so he doesn't even want to use his disc yet. He wants to keep it around for a better moment. Tapping three. Is he going to play a sedge? No, he's going to animate all the factories. Attack for six. Edo's on a measly five life. Needs a miracle here. He needs another stasis. He's going to take his time here, untapping his lance. Can he find another stasis to stay in the game? Let's have a look. I don't think so. There's another island. What does he have in hand there? A twiddle and a counterspell. That's it. That's it. Unfortunately, here for Edo, I felt like his deck wasn't really... Um, yeah, it wasn't really getting there. It wasn't really showing us its full potential, but it was really cool to see Chris's deck in action, especially that game number one, Chris, where you managed to get Chaos Orb and a Guardian Beast into play together. Here we see your beautiful deck. Congratulations on winning here your, uh, your first game at the Camel Trophy. And if you'd like to see more matches from this tournament, make sure to come back next week, Friday, because then I have another match from this event. It was really nice. There were a lot of nice brews, and I'm looking forward to show them to you. Now, before you go, I'd like to ask you to like, share, and comment on this video. Those, those things are completely free, and they really help the channel move forward. And then there is one other thing that you can do, and that is become a member of the Timmy Talks Patreon page. Here you can see a screenshot of the page itself. It is um, kind of the way that you can support what I do, and you can help me to continue making content. So if you like what I do, please consider becoming a Patreon. It already starts with $1 a month. So it's just a little bit of money, but it can really help my channel move forward. For now, thank you very much for watching, and let's take a look at our fantastic, wunderbar, amazing channel members and patrons. Let's go to the end scroll. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? Ik het als fikker te somber gezien.